Amen. Yep. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. You may be seated. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. We could almost give it an invitation to go home, couldn't we? <laughs> but I don't want to have to answer for that, so we won't do that. We are certainly glad you're here with us to worship today and hope you've been blessed already by the fellowship, by the music, by the message, and know that uh, today is, is Resurrection Sunday. Every Sunday is a Resurrection Sunday, but today is Easter Sunday, and we celebrate that in a special way. We're glad that you're here to do that with us. We want you to feel welcome and loved, accepted. We do that a couple of ways, and um, in a real way, in just a minute, we're going to greet one another. But we want to take time to, uh, to have you fill out a card. There's a card there in front of you, a Connect card. If you're a guest with us today, we want to, to know you're here and touch base with you. You can fill that card out. Let us know a little bit about you. You can put that in one of our tithe boxes here in the front or the back of the worship center when, uh, when the service is over. You can also scan the QR code or text to our phone number. We, we just want to know you're, uh, you're with us today and find out how maybe we can connect with you in a, in a real way and give you a place to worship, a place to use your gifts and talents, a place where you can feel welcome again and loved and accepted. So uh, please do that for us if you're a guest. 
on the other side of that card for anybody who needs it. Again, it's a spot for prayer requests. And please let us know how we can pray for you. We do that each week in our, uh, our staff meeting time. They're very diligent and responsible with that. I want you to know that uh, we'd like to help you uh, pray through something if you need that. Most of all, we're glad you're here today. We want to take a moment to greet one another. So let's stand, maybe find somebody you haven't seen today yet, and uh, greet them. So. Amen. Thank you for that. Enjoy hearing your fellowship. Let's continue to do that as we sing again and proclaim in a mighty way. I hope this is your testimony anyway that uh, you have been saved. Amen.
this together. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Would you pray with me? Dear, dear Father, Holy God, We thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house together. Lord, on this Resurrection Sunday, Lord, fill us with your spirit. 
Fill this place so that we feel your love. Lord, we know you love us. Your character is above all others, Lord. You are holy and righteous and merciful and just. None can compare to you, Father. Lord, we thank you so much that your love was so great that you would send your precious, precious son, Jesus, to come and live among us and then to go through a cruel and painful death on the cross. Lord, we, today we, we need to remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for loving us that much. And then today we are, our hearts are full of celebration and thanksgiving. Lord, you didn't leave him there, no. You brought him back to life and he lives today. He is alive. Thank you, Father, for this gift. Lord, I just thank you that we can live filled with your spirit. Lord, fill us, rain it down on, our, on us, on our families, on our children, on our communities, on our country, Father. Lord, help us to acknowledge your love, to repent, to turn from sin. Help us to be full of you so much that it spills out and people can't help but know that it is not us, but it is you that lives within us, Father. Lord, I pray that you will give protection and comfort and peace and love and all those things that you are to the people here today and the people who are not here today. Father, we thank you and praise you so much today. We ask all of these things in your precious, precious name. Amen. Because of this Resurrection Sunday, we have the hope and the promise of a day with no more night and no more tears. and heaven will pass away it's not a dream God will make all things new that day gone is the curse from which I stumbled and fell banished to eternal hell. No more night, no more pain, no more tears, never crying. And praises to the great I am. We will live in the light of the risen Is the praises to Christ our King. Slowly the names from the book are read. I know the King, so there's no need, no need to dread.
never crying again and praises to the great I am we will live in the light of the risen Lamb see over there there's a mansion for me where I will live with my Savior eternally and there will be no more night no more pain no 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 Never, never crying again and praise us to the great I am. We will live in the light of the reason love for praise us to the great. Charlie, and thank you, church, for your worship today. What a beautiful time to come together and express our praise to the Lord for what this day symbolizes and we remember, but also for what every day symbolizes and remember. Who is this man? This past week, we call it Passion Week because we recognize the glory and also we recognize the suffering. Of Jesus. What began last week with Palm Sunday, Jesus coming into town, riding in on a donkey, and the people declaring him, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, ended the week with the same people when they didn't get what they wanted of crying out to crucify him. On Monday and Tuesday, Jesus comes back into Jerusalem after Palm Sunday, and we hear of Jesus teaching. We hear of Jesus healing the blind and the lame. We hear of the Pharisees and the religious leaders coming to try and test Jesus and ask him all kinds of questions for which Jesus has an answer. And he suffices all of their demands, though they are trying to find something that Jesus can say that will incriminate himself that they can hold against him until finally there comes a point When they quit asking him questions because Jesus has turned the tables and now asked them to consider their own choices. On Wednesday, we don't know a whole lot about what's taking place other than it was possibly the day that that, that Mary, Lazarus' sister, may have anointed Jesus with a jar of perfume as Jesus says for burial. And then on Thursday, we call it Maundy Thursday. Maundy, we get the word mandate from or command from. We see on this Thursday the commands and the mandates that Jesus gives to his disciples. When in the upper room, he shows them and tells them of his love and his service as he sets an example before them as he serves them and asks them to do the same. All of this while Judas is betraying Jesus, going to the religious leaders and going to take them to where Jesus is because he knows the place Jesus will be that evening in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we read the words of Jesus being there and praying earnestly because this is a heavy moment for him. Jesus knows what is coming. 
He knows what's going to take place. He has walked to Jerusalem with that in his mind, though nobody else understands it. He's alone in his understanding. And as he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, not only is he praying fervently, but on a full moon night that's visible with no disguise of darkness, there in the Garden of Gethsemane in the Mount of Olives, Jesus can look down and he can see Jerusalem's gates. And because he can see Jerusalem's gates, he's praying no less to the Father and, and back and forth and coming several times and asking the Father, Lord, if, if there's some other way we can do this, let's do it that way, but not my will, but your will be done. At the same time, I can't help but think Jesus is also looking down and he can see a couple of miles away the gate where the soldiers are coming through to get him. And as he sees the gate where the soldiers are coming through to get, he can see the torches, even though it's full moon, he can see all of that. He knows this group of people are coming. He has time to get away, to stand up, to quit praying and take off, to go this way, that way, some other way, but get away and not stay. But what does Jesus choose to do? He chooses to stay. Monday, Thursday leads to Jesus' arrest. His arrest leads into what we sometimes call, or what we call, Good Friday. But, but when I stop to consider what's good about Friday, I don't know that there's a lot of good for Jesus on Friday. Arrest, taking from one trial to another trial, illegal trial, all through the morning, all through the night, being accused, being misrepresented, being mistreated, being abused knowing that one of his disciples has betrayed him and another disciple has denied knowing him. What's good about any of that? What's good about being transferred over to Pilate and then to Herod and then back to Pilate, only for them to not find any reason for Jesus to be condemned to death, but for his own people to cry out now for his crucifixion? What's good about that? Well, what's good about Jesus then being taken in the back barracks and being flogged unrecognizable, not the same person that you see going in that's coming out, because they beat him. What's good about that? What's good about going to a cross and being nailed onto a tree and crucified? What good is in that? What good is in death, of Jesus' death? And what we understand what Good Friday means, the good is not for the one bringing it but for those of us who need it. And so we come to understand Good Friday. Jesus makes Good Friday good. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Who is this man? Jesus could have been stoned to death. That would have been the Jewish form of execution. And that stoning would have happened in a matter of, of minutes. And death would have come after a few minutes. Of being pushed off of a cliff to start it off and then stoned to make sure that death was given. Or Jesus could have been beheaded, which was another way of execution for the Romans, which would have been meant that death was over in a matter of just moments and, and seconds that death would have been there. But Jesus wasn't stoned and Jesus wasn't beheaded. Jesus was crucified. Crucified, the most cruelest form of punishment and suffering known to man, still today, to be put on a cross and hung for the elements through time to take away your life. And there were criminals who stayed on a cross for three and four days, and finally the elements would take their life and they would die not having anything to eat or drink. They would, but if they didn't have enough time for you to stay on the cross for three or four days, they made sure you didn't stay on there very long. And so what did they do to Jesus? They flogged him. They beat Jesus to the point that he was not recognizable. He had lost so much blood 
His strength was gone. He couldn't carry his cross beam to the place of crucifixion. Someone else had to carry it for him. And there on the cross, Jesus is nailed. He's hung up to die, and Jesus dies. Crucifixion was the deterrent. It would say to people, don't be like this person. You don't want to end up like this. Death would be over days sometimes. We know that Jesus on the cross of the time that we recognize was suffering for six hours after being arrested on Thursday night and beaten and taken through the night and not having any rest at all or anything to eat. He is weak. He is abused. He is crucified. And Jesus dies on the cross. The incarnation of Jesus tells us that God came into our world, that God came into our time, that God came into our understanding to take care of our penalty, our debt, through his provision of Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross covers our sin. But what if it stopped there? What if that's all there was? What if there's not a resurrection? Why? a resurrection. What would we have without the resurrection? Jesus rescues our past, our present, our future sins. He pays for our penalty of sin because we recognize the cross as the door to salvation, but it cannot be separated from the empty tomb of salvation. One takes care of our debt while the other empowers our living. Without the resurrection, we're left to do things on our own, your own strength. Jesus took care of your problem, but you got to take care of the rest. In other words, step back, think about your best shot, and give it. How's that going to work out? We not only need a rescuer, We need direction. And so we recognize that Jesus would have to pay a debt over and over and over again if it was left up to us because we can't do it. What we need is a new life. What we need is a new creation. And so we have scripture that tells us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. We need the resurrection. Don't stop today in recognizing what took place on Friday without living through the weekend and knowing that what takes place today finalizes what God has in store for us. 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. It doesn't stop with Christ dying for our sins. He was buried and rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures, according to the Word of God, Every word that we have in Scripture is there for a reason. All of them, they teach us, they lead us, they guide us. Scripture tells us again, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Without the resurrection, we don't have salvation. We have a covering We have repentance, but we have no indwelling. We have no empowering. Jesus died for our sins, but Jesus was also buried and rose again on the third day. Today, we look at our scripture in Matthew chapter 28. I hope that you've already found it. Beginning in verse 1, it says this. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angels said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away with the, from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings. Greetings. You want to hear that one day? Greetings. Hi. Hello. Greetings. The women worship Jesus, and then Jesus then tells them to go and tell his brothers that he will see them in Galilee. What do we see taking place? It's interesting. I, I try and, and form what's happening on this day the best way I can. And as we look at our text today, we see Mary Magdalene and Mary, the other Mary. Well, who's the other Mary? This other Mary is the Mary of, of James and Joseph. We recognize two women are moving to the tomb on the first day of the week after the Sabbath. They're getting there, and when we recognize this story, and we also put together Mark's story, where Mark says it's Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and also Salome, the mother of James and John. There are three women that are moving to the tomb. Luke doesn't tell us the names. He says the women. John definitely includes Mary Magdalene going. But when you put all the pieces together, what happened? We have every word here for a reason. And as I see the words taking place, I, I'm trying to picture how it happened because why would Mary Magdalene run back and tell Peter and John that they've taken the body if she'd seen Jesus on the way back from the tomb? Why would the angels speak to the women if there's just two there and Mary Magdalene's not there anymore? It's only Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, unless Salome is there with her. There's women. And so I, I, I get this idea, this picture of how it all forms for me because I want it to make sense because the Word of God does not contradict itself. Because it says one angel doesn't mean there weren't two. Because it says there were two doesn't mean there weren't three. We put the big picture together and we see, this is what I see. It tells us that there was an earthquake. The earth shook as Jesus died. And the earth shakes again on Resurrection Sunday morning. An angel goes to the tomb and rolls back the stone and sits on it. Who owns the stone? God owns the stone. He didn't roll the stone away so that Jesus could get out. He rolled the stone away so that others could go in. And as these three women, I guess, are there, the way that I see it in my mind, looking at Scripture, trying to make it consistent, is it Mary Magdalene must have been there and seen this happen, seen the stone rolled away, maybe seen an angel or not, but seen an opening there where the hole was, Looking inside, Jesus isn't there. The Roman guards are there on the ground. Mary, mother of James and Joseph and Salome are with, them, with her. And she turns and runs at that point to go tell Peter and John that someone's taken the body. While Mary, mother of James and Joseph and Salome are there, and as they are there, the angel speaks to the women. He says, I know your mission. I know why you're here. You're here because you think you need to prepare a body for burial, but guess what? <laughs> There's no body. He's not here. He has risen just like he told you guys, but you didn't understand. Just as he said, come and see where they laid the body, and then go and tell his disciples, 
Go and tell his disciples. The women in the scripture talk about the, they go then and they are fearful, but it's a reverent fearful. They're also filled with joy because they've had a divine experience with an angel who's told them what's taken place and they've given them another assignment. They had an idea and a mission in going to the tomb. What were they going to do at the tomb? They were already thinking in, in Mark and in Luke, the, the story is told how the women are asking and says, how can we move the stone? Well, number one, how are you going to move a stone that has a seal on it? You're not. There's a guard that's there. They're not going to let you do anything inside because there's a seal on the stone and there's a guard that's been posted. But God took care of that. Angel comes and these guards are so scared they shake and they fall down as if they're dead. You get that picture? I don't know if you, you see anybody like this going. Or if they're just totally shaking because they don't understand. And then as the women leave to go and say to the disciples what the angel has told them to tell them, the guards make their way into town and they have their report. And in all that meantime, as Jesus appears then on the road to Mary, mother of James and Joseph and Salome, Mary Magdalene and John and Peter are running past through them again to go back to the tomb. And there, Peter and John run into this tomb, and they recognize that Jesus isn't there, and John is believing, and Peter's trying to figure out what's going on. And they then go back, and Mary is there by herself, as we read in the book of John. And that's when Jesus comes to her and says, Oh, Mary. And she turns and knows who it is. The resurrection. Go and tell. Good Friday embraces Resurrection Sunday. Why did the angel say, tell my brothers or tell his disciples, and Jesus said, tell my brothers, I'm going to meet them in Galilee. You know the story, right? Galilee is not in Jerusalem. That's Judea. Galilee is north. Or actually, as I'm looking at it, it's really going to be <laughs> west if you're looking at the, the map. So we're looking Galilee north of, of Judea. And as they're moving, they're not going to be in Galilee for a while. They're in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, I'm going to see them in Galilee. Why in Galilee? One, I, I don't understand, here again, putting all the pieces together, but Jesus surprises them that night when he appears to them in Jerusalem. Ten of them, Thomas isn't there. Where are they? They're in a room that's going to be used several times for very specific and special things. Jesus knew this was a room to be prepared for a special time with his disciples because it's the same room that he was with them in as they prepared the, the Passover meal that he reordered into the Lord's Supper. It's there that they also probably were hiding in fear of the Jewish leadership. It's going to be there that they're going to see Jesus on Resurrection Sunday night. It's going to be there that the next week Thomas is going to be with them and he's going to declare this is my God and my, my Lord and my God. It's going to be there that they're going to stay after Jesus ascends for 10 days praying until the Holy Spirit empowers them to go and share the gospel. And 3,000 people are added to Jesus' church that day. This room, this place, why not I'll see you tonight in the room? Jesus has something in the future for them as well as for that night. And Jesus goes and meets them in Galilee. They're there. They go fishing. Jesus meets them in Galilee, in the Capernaum area. They're on the seaside, on the shore. As he's there, he has the, the fish food as they come off the, the water. Jesus has the correspondence and the conversation with John and with, with, with Peter reinstate him. He goes to Galilee to meet with them. He continues to teach them. Historians feel like that probably the 500 that saw Jesus alive was probably in the Galilee area. And so Jesus says, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. That's a part of the future that's going to take place. But tonight, I'm going to see you. You don't know this yet, but I'm going to see you in that room. And he does. Jesus is, is witnessed alive by Mary Magdalene, by the women, by Peter, by two on the road to Emmaus that day, but also by the disciples minus Thomas 
that night. What an incredible place. What an incredible story. We can't stop with the cross. We need today to be full. Our salvation has bookends on it. Jesus came to die for us, but he also rose from the grave for us. He took care of our sin and our penalty, but he also comes to live in us and be our direction and our guide. And tonight, this afternoon, you have the opportunity of remembering all of what today means. But right now, I don't want you to miss this. It is not enough to be a theist and believe in God. It's not enough to be a theist and believe in God. We must believe in Jesus. It's not enough to consider Jesus a good person, that he healed the sick, he helped the lame to walk, he fed the thousands, he walked on the water, he brought dead back to life. It's not enough to consider Jesus just that even he paid for our sins, we must consider that Jesus died on the cross, but that he rose from the dead. And so today we ask the question, do you believe in the resurrection? Today we come to celebrate that Jesus is alive, that the tomb is still empty, and that he has ascended with the promise to return one day, and at any point in time, we need to be ready. As the angels told the women, come and see where they lay, and then go and tell, he redefined their mission. As our mission is redefined, let's come and look, let's come and evaluate, let's come and see together, and then let's go and tell. Let's go and tell. Today, let me ask you a question. Are you here to celebrate Easter because of what Jesus did? Or are you here today to celebrate what Jesus is doing? Our churches are going to be full today all over the world of people who celebrate what Jesus has done without knowing he wants to continue to work in us. And if he's working in us, then there's a call to be together. Not just on this special day, but next Sunday. And the Sunday after that. And the Sunday after that, if we understand the transformation that Jesus wants to bring to our life, and not just the transaction of something he did for us a long time ago, but he comes to live in us, and as he lives in us, he changes us. There's a urgency to be sure. I don't know of anybody who's married that doesn't know it. You know if you're married or not, right? I know people who claim to be Christians that don't know it. That's sad. Because John... The gospel writer and also wrote four of the books in our New Testament gave us these words in 1 John. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Today, if you know that you have eternal life, then we celebrate the cross and we celebrate the resurrection. But if you don't know today don't leave without being sure. Don't leave without the opportunity to come down. At the end of our service, sometimes we don't say this every time, but there's some boxes down here and there's some boxes in the back, and we have a room at the back called the Next Steps Room, and we would love to visit with you more about what Next Steps can be. But we always, always, we haven't done away with the invitation at Trinity Baptist Church. It's just that nobody responds we don't see this as our opportunity to come and celebrate with the church our giving, our offering before the Lord, or to come and make a decision about how I want to follow Jesus stronger and love him more, or to come and join the church. You can join the church any day of the week, but you can also do it at our time of invitation to come and ask, how can I know that Jesus is my Lord and Savior? I want you to know the words are up there, and it says that we think that that covers it, but let me share with you, there's a response time coming at the end of my words here in just a moment for you to make a decision and to celebrate what God is doing in our midst. We are the family of God called Trinity Baptist Church. 
And he has put us on a mission to let's get together and let's talk about it and let's see. And then let's go and tell. So here in just a moment, we'll have a time of response. And whatever the Lord is asking you to do, I pray that you'll be willing to move at his leading and be obedient to what he is asking. Are you certain? Do you know for sure? If not, I know a prayer doesn't save you, but a prayer brings you into a relationship. It does save us because it's the words of our heart. And if you've never prayed a prayer of salvation, then you could pray a prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died on the cross. I know you rose from the dead. And I claim you as my Lord and Savior today. Come and live in me. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you needed that prayer to be certain, then we would love to know about it because there are next steps we want to share with you about how we walk together in faith. Good Friday was only good for us because of what Jesus did for us. Resurrection Sunday completed the deal because he now can come and live in us because he's alive. Father, I pray that you'll use this time that we have now of response to lead your people, to lead your church in the directions of obedience. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity of celebrating that Jesus is alive. There's a tomb, whether it's the right tomb or something like it there in Jerusalem outside the city gate, that's still empty. Father, we know that Jesus is alive. We know that Jesus is in heaven. We know that he's at your right side. We know that he is coming again one day, and we want to be ready when he comes. And we want to, others to be ready also. We have come to calculate and think and consider and talk about it this morning. Now send us to tell others who need to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Amen.
It's good to see each and every one of you this Sunday as you're spending time with family and friends. Next Sunday, I think this whole area is we're going to slightly lose our minds. <laughs> Next Sunday, uh, there is one service at 9 a.m. And there are all Bible study classes will be at 10 a.m. And those will be in your regular places except for one class. Um, so you'll want to come and be a part of next Sunday, slightly different schedule. Now be warned, there will be no donuts. <laughs> so you can bring them, but you're going to have to share. <laughs> so there are no donuts next week. The eclipse is coming a week from tomorrow. We do have a few glasses that are still available. A few, we have a stack of glasses that are still available. Now those are no good to you after a week from Monday. You can't, if you use them as, to drive with, you can't even see high beams in, directly in front of you. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> so we have some glasses that are available. You can uh, come to the church office or you can see me this morning and we'll get you some of those. Now we do have Eclipse yard signs that share that God is light and in him is no darkness. Now we can put those out for the Eclipse. They are still good for, for weeks afterwards. And so we have a few of those signs left also that you can take and put in your front yard. Ladies, uh, the uh, a new session of the Women's Bible Study is starting up quick. Uh, you'll see that information in your announcement guide and you can get uh, connected uh, to get signed up for that. If somebody wants to bring two donuts and five kolaches next week, We'll see how far it goes if there's not 12 <laughs> baskets left over, but we'll uh, go from there. Thank you for being with us today. This is such an uh, awesome, wonderful, incredible day to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Would you stand and receive this blessing that the Lord has for us? Let these words that we've already shared together be the words that carry us through the week. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen.